Welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was jointly hosted by the New York City and San Antonio Bogleheads Chapters and recorded August 24, 2022. It features a discussion on the philosophy of Stoicism and concepts of behavioral finance. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as personalized investment advice. What we're, we're showing here, is that clear to everybody? Great. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, uh, Miriam. And also, uh, thank, thank you, Jim and Lady Geek, uh, for the help um, and getting this all set up. Um, so, yeah, what we'll be presenting on today is uh, Stoicism and behavioral finance, right? So uh, one, of the, one of the first questions is how can stoicism benefit your personal finance goals, right? Uh, there's the connection between stoicism and finance concepts can help us achieve our personal finance goals and peace of mind, right? So this is kind of why we're here, right? And why we're presenting on this topic. Um, so one of the ideas behind this is framing. Um, to help us make good financial decisions, even in turbulent markets. Uh, and one of the, the key ideas here is, is the idea of, of, of framing, right? Another big concept within Stoicism is the idea of focusing on what is in your control and differentiating between what we can change and what we cannot. You'll hear uh, what is in our control. That's something you'll hear a lot uh, when people are talking about Stoicism. Uh, another idea here, um, which is kind of uh, related to framing, right, is appreciating <laughs> what we have uh, more than feeling of misery over what we don't have, right? So uh, learning appreciation. Another is focusing on putting in our best effort uh, rather than defining success by the outcome. So the idea here being focusing a little bit more on the process rather than uh, explicitly on results, right? Another idea here is uh, kind of learning to control your reaction uh, rather than letting the outcome uh, define our experience and our reaction. And then also in finding strength and tranquility uh, through objectivity and rationality. So a lot of these ideas you'll kind of hear us uh, reiterate uh, throughout this, this presentation. Um, and then another idea is to identify biases uh, to help us make better choices. And then another big idea is, is understanding uh, loss, aversion. So next, Guri is gonna walk through the agenda. Fantastic, thank you, Luke. And uh, similarly, thanks to the many people um, who helped make this possible. Guri, could you raise your volume, please? Sure, sorry, my mic was okay. far away from my math, thanks. Um, so similar to Luke's comments, uh, many thanks to uh, the team of people who helped make this possible. So as Luke mentioned, um, I'll cover the agenda. Uh, he just covered item number one here, which is how stoicism can benefit you with your personal finance decisions. Um, following this slide, I'll cover three early contributors, three Roman contributors to stoic philosophy. Luke will cover some similarities between Stoicism and Boglehead philosophy. He'll also cover a metaphor of a greyhound and a rabbit uh, and the takeaway lesson to that. And uh, Luke will also cover, um, interestingly, Seneca, one of the early Roman contributors and a pro prolific writer, wrote about, um, wrote to his friend a letter called On Retirement. And so Luke will cover that. Um, we'll cover an intro to Stoicism, really high level for folks who aren't yet familiar with it. Uh, Luke will cover mental impressions and objectivity and uh, through a working diagram, walk through a practical application of a lot of what we're talking about. Luke will then cover um, some of Jack Bogle's uh, overlay on emotions and reason. And then I'll cover five slides on the philosophy of Stoicism in a little more detail. There's so much depth to Stoicism, but we wanna keep it somewhat digestible. So um, we'll, we'll cover some foundational concepts there. 
And from that, we'll transition to behavioral finance. Specifically, in the invite, uh, a lot of folks would have seen the link to the wiki. There's a comprehensive summary of behavioral finance pitfalls, so we'll touch on a few of those. Um, we'll specifically highlight some of the work of Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel in for his work in applying psychology to behavioral finance. Then we'll close with some quotes. We'll um, post some additional resources like books, and then we'll turn Q&A over to the audience. And with that, uh, we'll begin with um, three early Roman contributors. So they're not in chronological order, starting with Marcus Aurelius. He's one of the more famous because um, a work of his indirectly got published. So for context, he was Roman emperor for 20 years. That's a big deal. He was the most powerful man in the world, given how sprawling the Roman empire was. And he was considered the last of the five good emperors. What does that mean? So many emperors were brutal, self-serving, um, and destructive. Uh, Marcus, on, on balance, was very good for his community and the empire. Um, and what we know from him as it relates to Stoicism is he kept a private journal to himself. These weren't notes meant to be published, uh, but academics compiled them, translated them, and it came to be called Meditations. So folks interested, and I'd highly recommend it, um, it's worth reading. His insights are timeless and super practical. You'll find, um, if you choose to read it, how relatable it is. He went through so many struggles, as you can imagine, as emperor. Um, and he just had these profound insights and practical tools to, to approach his obstacles. And with that, um, his guidance is still empowering 2,000 years later. Uh, so that's Marcus. Next, Seneca the Younger. He's the most prolific writer of these three. He was a playwright, and he was also one of the wealthiest people in Rome at his time. He, the equivalent, he would be a billionaire um, at, for his time. He was an advisor to Nero, and for which he was ultimately exiled. Um, but he was, uh, as a playwright and pro prolific author, much of his work survives, and he was such a good writer that his contributions to Stoicism are um, longstanding. And the last that we'll cover here is Epictetus. Epictetus was born a slave, um, but he earned his freedom, um, and he became a philosophy teacher. He studied philosophy, and became a teacher. And although he didn't write directly, one of his students transcribed his teaching. So his work survives uh, and contributes to us today. So that's some context for um, the stoicism that we have access to via original sources or semi-original sources. And I say that to differentiate from academics who write about it. OK. Great. Next, we'll be uh, discussing some philosophical similarities uh, between the philosophy of Stoicism as well as the Boglehead investment philosophy. Um, which kind of funny, funny story when I was building this slide. Originally, I'd planned on talking about things that were strictly Stoic and things that were strictly Boglehead, and then just kind of talking about some similarities. But what was interesting, I, I actually had a very difficult time finding something that could fit into this category. So I kind of was forced uh, to, to uh, revise how we did the slide. I thought that was kind of interesting um, since the Boglehead tends to be applications and prudence. Um, so uh, the first, right? Uh, so within uh, the philosophy of uh, Stoicism, uh, the founder of this was actually uh, Zeno of Sidium. Uh, who, who founded Stoicism uh, during the, the Hellenistic era of, of Greece, right? So he was uh, with, within, with, he was in Athens um, when, when he founded this, this school, which is uh, one of the many schools um, of, in Athens at that time. And then of course, uh, the Boglehead uh, investment philosophy, uh, which is based on uh, Jack Bogle, uh, the founder of Vanguard, who, of course, is a proponent of index funds, um, who lived from uh, May 8th, 1929 through January 16th, 2019. Um, one other thing I would note about uh, Zeno 
is he, he lived uh, some, somewhere around 334 to 262 BC, right? So we're talking about uh, about 2300 years ago. Um, so quite, quite a while ago. And some of the other folks that we had mentioned earlier, some of the Romans, right? That was, you know, 100 uh, plus uh, years uh, AD, right? So we're talking about uh, hundreds of years of, of this school of philosophy uh, thri thriving uh, within the Greek um, and Roman eras. A uh, couple of similarities, right? We're talking about applications and prudence, right? Wisdom, uh, applied wisdom. These are things that you find similar between uh, Bogleheads and uh, the philosophy of Stoicism. Uh, the idea of focusing on what you control, right? Uh, a lot of the wisdom that you find within Jack Bogle uh, and, 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 and his philosophy is, is really focusing on the things that you, you control. Um, and then also there's, there's the idea of recognizing human psychological tendencies and then changing your opinions through rationality uh, based on uh, recognizing uh, some of your, your, your own uh, self behaviors, right? And then there's also strategies to, to replace uh, certain unhealthy and possibly irrational emotions um, and, and try to replace those uh, by healthy and rational ones. Um, and then another uh, idea that, you know, these, these two groups uh, tend to think similarly is spending time on forethought and preparation, as well as uh, learning from the past, right? Um, what can, what can uh, you know, the, the, the ancients teach us? Or if we look at history, what can we learn? Um, a couple of things that we are not going to, uh, well, I guess <laughs> one, one idea that I do want to address um, is uh, the word stoic, right? If you look it up in a dictionary, it actually kind of means cold and emotionless, which is actually a bit of a, uh, a misinterpretation. And Sometimes you have to, uh, that basically that, that word throughout time has changed its definition. Um, but really, uh, so we, within, when you're talking about Stoic philosophy, a lot of times how they uh, make this distinction is with a capital S is, is Stoic. Uh, and this is in reference to the school of philosophy versus uh, Stoic with a small s, which is cold and emotionless. And what's actually interesting is uh, practicing Stoic philosophy actually has the exact opposite effect of being cold and emotionless. It actually, uh, there's, there's studies, there's recent studies that have shown uh, that it actually makes people more warm and empathetic. So it's actually interesting how uh, the definition of the word Stoic can be completely misrepresentative of uh, the Stoic school of philosophy. And then, oh, one other thing, uh, the word stoic, what that means, that came from the Greek word porch, right? So they used to practice their philosophy on uh, the, the porch of uh, the, the, it was the, the, the uh, what, stoa pokile, which, forgive my mispronunciation of that, um, but it's basically where they went and uh, practiced philosophy. So really, they were the, 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 the group of folks that would go talk on the porch. All right, so next we're gonna touch on a grit metaphor uh, that, that Jack Bogle, he actually uh, used during a March 23rd, 2007 commencement speech at the New York uh, NYU uh, Stern School of Business. Um, and this is a, a story originally by Reverend Fred Craddock. Um, and interestingly enough, it's between the Reverend and a Greyhound. So, so, of course, it's, you know, a true story. Um, the, uh, so, so it started off, so, so the Reverend asked, are you still racing? To which the Greyhound says, no. Uh, the Reverend asks, well, what is the matter? Did you get too old to race? No, I still had some race left in me, said the Greyhound. Well, what then? Did he not win? Uh, I won over a million dollars for my owner. Well, then what was it? Bad treatment? Oh no, they treated us royally when we were racing. Well, did you get crippled? No, didn't get crippled. Well, then why? Why? I quit, said the Greyhound. You quit? 
I quit. Why did you quit? And then the Greyhound responds, I just quit because after all that running and running and running, I found out that the rabbit I was chasing wasn't even real, right? So, so what's, what, what's kind of the idea here, right? So uh, we'll kind of pose a question, right? So, you know, what, what rabbit are you chasing, right? Is the rabbit you are chasing real, right? And so kind of the idea that we maybe want to highlight here is, you know, perhaps it's worth considering uh, if what you pursue is real and really worth that pursuit. And that kind of gets into the idea of uh, priorities. Um, so next, we're going to come into uh, some some sayings from uh, from Seneca, right? Which this is on on saving for retirement, um, and this is a kind of a, a couple ideas here is discussing financial wealth versus wealth of mind. So the first idea here, right? For many people, the acquisition of wealth is not the end of troubles, but only a fresh start. So no surprise there. The fault is not in one's surrounding, but in the mind itself. Uh, will you wait for interest to accrue, for ventures to pay off, for some fat inheritance, uh, when you could become rich right away, right? Wisdom pays off immediately. Its wealth is bestowed on all to whom wealth has come to seem irrelevant. So trust me, you should make philosophy your out, out advocate. It will persuade you not to linger over your balance sheet. And so just to kind of keep in mind, this is, this is around 62 AD, right? So this is, you know, just, just under 2000 years ago uh, that, that we're talking about. Um, and he's talking about these ideas, right? So, yeah, so kind of highlighting the idea that the, you know, the human condition, uh, you know, it, it extends quite a bit into the past. And some of this wisdom uh, that, you know, the ancients can teach us, it's applicable to us today. Um, but there's an idea here, right? A, a distinction between financial wealth and the idea of, the, of a wealth of mind, right? Uh, the idea of, you know, peace of mind, uh, your character, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, the, so the, the, the Stoics, they actually don't deem financial wealth as either virtuous nor vicious, it's something that it depends on how you use it, right? So you can use wealth in a virtuous way or it can be used in a vicious way, right? So it is treated in that way that depending on how you use it, which depends on your mind, uh, depends is, is basically how they would view wealth. So the next slide will, uh, Gory is going to uh, talk about intro to Stoicism. Great. Thanks, Luke. So um, again, we'll get into detail with some foundational Stoic concepts uh, after a few slides. So the next two slides will be really high level. Um, there's some debate in, in academia about the primary purpose of Stoicism. So we keep the, we, uh, we're keeping it pretty general here. One of the main concepts is to live virtuously, just like uh, Luke was talking about um, how, how folks spend money. Money itself is objective. It's neither good nor bad. So uh, virtue is the, the potential to pursue virtue is within each of us. And the Stoics focused on four cardinal virtues, those being courage, justice, temperance, and practical wisdom. Temperance meaning moderation and practical wisdom, meaning not just intellectual knowledge, but to put what you've learned into practice. They felt so strongly about this. They felt that just learning something and not practicing it was almost as good as not learning it. Um, another core uh, foundational concept to Stoicism is that we can avoid unnecessary negative emotions. And I'll differentiate, uh, as Luke did, that it's not about being emotionless, but um, Stoicism and even, as, as Luke mentioned, how it survived 2,000 years, uh, folks familiar with CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, which is rooted in, in Stoicism, finds that we, we don't need to suffer through our negative emotions. We may experience them reflexively for a variety of reasons, but we don't need to stay in that state. 
um, moving on. So again, academia debates, is it about happiness, contentedness, some say tranquility, but the, the idea is similar enough that th through Stoic philosophy, contentedness and tranquility are within us and the overlay to personal finance or behavioral finances, obviously vicissitudes of the market, how your portfolio performs. So we'll go into um, more detail later on that. But the, the immediate practicality is you are able to empower yourself with tools that help you reduce worries and anxiety. And um, as mentioned earlier, the converse of what Stoicism, we should talk about what Stoicism isn't. So it doesn't say that you shouldn't enjoy positive things. You certainly can. Uh, you can enjoy positive emotions and positive possessions, uh, experience happiness, but not define yourself, your contentedness, your self-worth on these things. So you can enjoy a big house or a fancy car, even though bogleheads may not may be less likely to define themselves with those things. Stoicism says our character and our virtue, our core, and other things are, we'll get to a phrase called preferred indifferent, so that uh, it's absolutely okay to, to enjoy things. So that, that's an important clarification for folks who are attached to the, the kind of lowercase stoic. Um, and then uh, stoicism allows us to meet challenges with calmness and reason. So we'll discuss a tool for that, which is preparing for catastrophes in advance so that when they finally present, you're empowered to deal with them. And uh, this will come up over and over again because it's so fundamental and it's focusing on things within your control. And part of that is how you respond to things. So in retrospect, we may regret having done something or having said something. And Stoicism reminds us that we're not uh, defined by what happens to us. We're, we're more defined by how we meet those things. Um, so the path to that is pausing, reflecting, and being thoughtful and intentional about how you respond and also separating yourself from those external events. And so philosophy tells us that uh, most things in the world are things external to us have an objectivity and we often assign our own judgments to them. We, we often label them as positive or negative, but many of these things in fact are neutral and minus our own judgments, uh, they exist in that neutrality. So next slide. In summary, um, again, stoicism is meant to, be, meant to be a practical toolkit. You can use it throughout the day, whatever challenges, and you can find equanimity and contentedness and tranquility by practicing a lot of it. Um, it does get easier with practice like many things. Um, and again, it's not intended to just be intellectual knowledge. And um, we'll leave off this slide with a quote from Seneca or a concept from Seneca. He says, the outside world will not give us happiness or unhappiness. Our character is the only guarantee of everlasting carefree happiness or tranquility. And with that, I'll turn it back to Luke. Great. So, so now we're going to touch on a couple of ideas uh, within Stoic philosophy. Uh, this idea of mental impressions and the idea of objectivity, um, and these these call fall within they they have the Stoic they have different they call them different disciplines, um, and this is the idea of uh, discipline of ascent. Um, and a high level way of thinking about this would be to only accept and act on objective mental impression, right? So what on earth does that mean? So let's, let's kind of walk through that a little bit. Um, so, so there's the idea of something, uh, there's an impression on your senses, right? You hear something, you see something, uh, that sort of thing, right? So for example, say the news media says, sell, sell, sell. So this is, by the way, this is gonna be a financial example. So we tried to make this a little bit practical to kind of give an idea of what we're talking about, right? So then you, you'll kind of have a mental impression, right? So something outside of you and then an impression on your mind, right? Um, and that's kind of where, for example, the idea enters your mind that you may consider selling uh, some, of, some of your assets in, in a downturn or something. 
Um, and so here, here, what we're going to show here is you have the external things that are kind of external to your mind. And then you have what's happening internally you, in, within, within your mind. Right. And then you, there's this other aspect of it. Right. So this is, uh, kind of, uh, a, a certain aspect of it. Right. But then, then you kind of have your, your judgment and your will, right. Uh, you, some of your more conscious ideas, right. That, so for, for example, you may have studied historic market resilience. You kind of understand market behavior, right? Um, so, so then basically these two things kind of combine and result in, in this idea that you can either accept or reject this mental oppression, right? So this is basically your judgment and your will uh, evaluates this. And then you, you can accept or reject that idea. Right. So, for example, you may reject the idea of selling uh, based on your knowledge of historic market resilience. Right. Um, so then you may take action or inaction. Right. So in this case, right, uh, do nothing and you'll stay the course, uh, which, of course, is, uh, uh, as Bogleheads know, is a very Boglehead saying. Right. Um, and then there's some type of outcome. Right. Um, and history has shown that this is you're more likely to achieve your financial goal, um, or at least that's one of the core tenets of Bogleheads, right? Um, and that's so. So, so the, the the Stoics would overlay another idea here, right? So they're gonna say, well, guess what? When you think about this whole process, what aspects of this are in your control versus what things are outside of your control, right? And so what they say is your judgment and your will and its interaction uh, with things that are outside of your control is really what you need to focus on, right? So their, their whole idea is to focus on things that are in your control. And all the practices, so, so Gori is going uh, gonna to talk about various uh, practices uh, that, that'll kind of help they're, they're all kind of intended to impact your judgment and will with the intent of allowing you to have better ascent, right? Um, so an example that, that the Stoics often use was, was the idea of an archer, right? So, so what things is the archer in control of, right? So he, he's, he's in control of how much he practices, you know, where, where he's aiming, how hard he's pulling the string back. Um, so like, that's basically his, his angle of launch. So, uh, and you know, his, his steadiness, some of those things are the things that he's, he's in control of, but at the end of the day, he has to release the arrow. Right. And at that point it becomes outside of his control and, uh, things in life, uh, can have its own influences, right? Wind, um, you know, that, that, that sort of thing. And so where it ends up hitting on the target, right, is that this is where the Stokes would say you are not in control of, right? You can do your best, but at the end of the day, there are still things that you do not control. Uh, so what they, the Stoics say is focus on the things that you control and then do your best, right? And don't focus necessarily on, on the outcome. Um, and then a couple of the uh, labeling, a couple things on this, uh, this diagram here, right? So the Stokes would say you want to focus on your, your center of rationality, right? This is kind of your, 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 your virtue. This is where virtue is. This is where it lies. This is where your character lies, right? So this is where you want to spend your time improving, right? And then the idea of the, the discipline of ascent, right, is to be objective, right? In what the things that you object and reject, right? And so a, a more modern way of thinking about this would be maybe some of your biases, right? You want to use uh, objectivity to help eliminate some of these, these biases. And, and Gory's gonna explain uh, some more on biases here a little bit later. Um, a couple of other examples of things that are in our control and outside of our control. Um, for example, your, your, and these are like Boglehead type examples, right? Uh, your, your asset allocation, that's something that is in your control. 
uh, your investment policy statement, right? Typically, you're going to write that when you're you're in a rational state, not in a <laughs> hyper emotional and uh, reactive state, right? Um, there's uh, within the idea of lifestyle creep, right? So as as you get older, um, or as you basically your desires kind of creep up, um, you want a bigger house, a bigger fancier car, um, that that sort of thing, right? So these this kind of ties back into the idea of desire, right? So there. Uh, and, and, and the Stokes are, believe that, 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 uh, a large portion of your desires are under your control, right? And so that part of the practices would aim at, at, uh, trying to keep some of your desires in check, right? Um, some things that are outside of your control, right? Uh, and this is relevant to, uh, the personal finance, um, that we're talking about here, right? is uh, market performance, political events, interest rates, inflation, right? These aren't things that, that you can control, right? So uh, you can take action to uh, mitigate these things, but you have to recognize that at the end of the day, you do not control these things. And so uh, Jack Bogle recognized uh, a, a lot of these ideas, right? Um, and in, in his article, Clash of Cultures, he, he kind of touched on a lot of these ideas. Um, you know, Jack, Jack was always, uh, very good with, uh, words and articulate, right? Um, so he, he said that intelligent investors try to separate their emotions of hope, fear, and greed, uh, that separate the volatile market of short-term expectation from the real market of long-term intrinsic value and trust in reason to prevail over the long term. And the last sentence here, he says, in this sense, long-term investors must be philosophers rather than technicians, right? So here, here, uh, you know, you see Jack highlighting, you know, the idea of reason um, and trying to separate out your emotion, uh, which you know is pretty on par with you know a lot of the things that 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 the Stoics say and try to practice. So next, we'll uh, hand off to. Gori, um, who's going to touch uh, on the philosophy of Stoicism. Excellent. Thanks, Luke. So again, um, we'll keep it somewhat high level, but go into a little more detail with some foundational concepts. Again, the, the key purpose can be debated within academia, so we'll keep it uh, pretty general here. Tools for uh, Stoicism offers tools for a life of meaningful equanimity, reduced anxiety, and heightened virtue, which we spoke about, avoiding unnecessary negative emotions. And what is unnecessary negative emotions? So on the, the spectrum of emotions, um, stoicism maintains that worry, envy, and, and regret are overall avoidable and destructive. So they have a purpose and, you know, folks can say, well, I worry, so I prepare for things or I preempt things and I solve things. But again, to stay in a sustained state of worry is often unnecessary. And stoicism helps us with that perspective. Uh, another purpose of stoicism is to enjoy positive things, but not rely on them with such a dependency that if it affects your self-worth so that you can, ex you can enjoy these externalities as we mentioned, but the phrase they, you, you, um, the phrase they have for these external things is preferred and different. So that can be good health, um, wealth, but you know, while you'd say, you know, good health is, is um, fundamental to a content life, uh, Stoicism argues that even without good health, you have your character. So as long as you have your character and you can pursue virtue, you can do without good health. And, you know, it's an easy, uh, easy to expand on that with wealth that sure, uh, having money is great, but even without money, you have your character. So um, it would take a lot to have your character removed from you. And there are many examples of this. Um, John Admiral Stockdale 
uh, his plane got shot down and he was parachuting and he knew that he was going to be a POW for a while. And he said, I'm entering the world of Epictetus. And he was the highest ranking officer while he was in captivity. And he, he maintained his character and through stoicism practiced leadership that also inspired um, the men who were also uh, imprisoned with him. Uh, moving on, satisfaction in life comes from overcoming challenges and benefiting society. This last piece, benefiting society, is also foundational to Stoicism. Um, they were encouraging of being active in community, active in politics. So it's not about being apathetic, and we'll talk about that more. It's about taking action to affect I'll say noble outcome. There's a lot of subjectivity in that, but it wasn't to resign yourself and accept the world around you. It was to, to cause change where it was in your ability to do so. Um, and when we say satisfaction comes from overcoming challenges, if you think about, you know, in our own lives, it's often something we overcame that was uh, super difficult in, in whatever it is, per personal or career or sports. Uh, those things derive, you know, we derive a lot of satisfaction from those. This next one, uh, building habits and practices, it's a reference to Seneca. He said, how great is it to have a disposition to good? So what does that mean? What if um, in, in modern day life, so many things that we enjoy are bad for us, right? Or to a certain extent, bad for us. And so many things that are good for us take a lot of effort or a lot of time. And you could argue saving and investing is more of a marathon, right? It's it's um, delayed gratification. But within Stoicism and in, with, within Vogelhead philosophy, there are many things that are easily accessible to us that are entirely enjoyable and also uh, not particularly expensive. So listing, listed here are some uh, nurturing habits like a lifestyle where your natural preferences are satisfying and healthy. And examples of that are healthy eating, preparing your own food, right? You can derive a lot of satisfaction from that and it happens to be good for you. Uh, taking walks in nature, hosting a game night amongst your friends, right? These things cost very little and they're super satisfying. Uh, pursuing self-improvement. Um, Stoics were big on journaling. We mentioned Marcus Aurelius kept a journal earlier. Um, meditation, not necessarily um, in the modern sense of meditation, but think, you know, reflecting on um, the day's events um, in advance, as, as well as when I say reflecting. So uh, looking at what you expect from the day ahead of you and then reflecting on it at the end. These were um, common stoic practices. And we'll end this slide with a quote, it is not death a person should fear, but never beginning to live, um, Marcus. And so we'll go to uh, the next slide, dichotomy of control. Uh, again, you'll hear about this throughout, uh, determining what's in our control and what's not. We each you know, whether it's ourselves or family or friends or coworkers, people are frustrated by all these things, but if they or we can separate, okay, here's a situation, what, it, what can we affect? What's in our control and what's not, right? It could be global politics. It could be something so much uh, broader than ourselves and beyond us. If you're able to effectively separate what's not within your control, as Luke mentioned, market performance, you know, we'll get more specific with examples like that. Um, the concept is so foundational and it's not exclusive to Stoicism, obviously. The serenity prayer, which a lot of people know, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we can and wisdom to know the difference, that the serenity prayer is uh, directly rooted in Stoic philosophy. Um, and again, it's Stoicism is not about resigning yourself to just accepting the world around us. It's separating, okay, this frustrates me or this brings me joy, What what's within my control? So local politics, you can obviously vote, you can write letters, you can read a, uh, you could start a campaign, you can affect your community, you can affect your relationships, and to a certain, to a large extent, you can affect your health. But Stoicism reminds us that our health is not entirely in our control. So separate the two and take action where you can. 
Um, and then you find comfort that you took action. And for those things that are out of your control, try to let them go. And stoicism will come easier and naturally to a lot of folks. Like some people have a natural affinity for it. Some people were practicing stoicism without knowing that term or that label for years or decades. Like you can go an entire lifetime living aligned with stoic philosophy, just not knowing that label. Um, and then there are other folks who will hear this and say, yeah, that, that sounds nice, but that's not really me or that's not possible. So I would say know that these tools are within you, are within your reach, but some people uh, it'll come much more naturally to, and some people, if it interests them, will find it'll, it'll take a little more work, but they, they really are practical, effective tools. Um, another core, don't tie your contentedness to the outcome. So we take action. Uh, Lucas mentioned the Archer example. I'll reiterate it on the next slide, I think, just because it's so uh, important. But know that you did everything within your control the best you could, and the outcome is not necessarily within your control. So we just accept the outcome. And you could apply that to portfolio construction. Um, that's within your control. Withdrawal rate is within your control. Market performance, obviously, not within your control. So if you know that you aligned your goals, timeframe, risk tolerance with your portfolio construction and you stayed the course when appropriate, if you find your asset allocation wasn't appropriate, that's within your control to change it. So those are practical applications of this um, core foundational concept. Um, another one, uh, people think like, oh, so much of my finances aren't in my control, but to, to some extent, you can increase your savings rate. You can try to increase your income. A lot of people will say, oh, that's not within my control. Um, you can often reduce your expenses. Bogleheads, you know, are completely adept at this. Uh, in terms of, I'll revisit the income for this um, last bullet. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm paid what I'm paid, but you can negotiate a raise, obviously, um, you can you can work towards a promotion, and you can say that those things aren't in your control, and it's true. But you can influence them, and you can learn negotiating techniques. There's a, tons of YouTube videos, or books, or blogs, and um, a technique is at your mid-year review or end-of-year review. You meet with your manager, and you say, "Okay." XYZ happened and I expected this and it may or may not have occurred, but can we agree on our approach for next year that if I accomplish X, Y, and Z and do it really well, that I'll be considered for a raise or promotion. So that's an example of something that is in your control applied to influence something that largely, you know, like a promotion or a raise can be seen conclusively as not within your control, but you can, you can learn what tools are in your control to affect it. And with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, focusing on process and systems, not outcome. So we kind of touched on this and um, Lucas mentioned the, the um, example of the archer, I'll reiterate it. So the, the choice of arrow is within your control. Uh, the quality of the arrow may or not be, may or may not be, but you'll, you'll get the best arrow you can. The tension on the bow, the direction, your focus, um, when to let go to, to send the arrow towards the target. A lot of these things are within your control, but stoicism teaches us that once you let go, that arrow and so many other you know examples that this applies to, that arrow is no longer in our control. So there could be wind, uh, the arrow could be faulty, someone could move the target, any of these things can happen. So why is that important? We should not tie our self-esteem or self-worth, or in a lot of cases, portfolio performance net, um, self, self-worth to our net worth, right? That for the things that are out of our control, realize that you did everything you could and what's out of your control doesn't define you. Okay, um, so a practical application of that and the following bullet, um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, highly, highly recommend if folks haven't um, read it already. Uh, it's an amazing, empowering book that helps you, uh, whether it's going to the gym or, you know, pursuing um, 
a, a hobby, turning a hobby into a side hustle. So many things um, they say we overestimate what we want to do in a short period of time, like a week or a month, but we really underestimate what we can do in a year or five years. And Atomic Habits lays out as you improve your process and your systems and your efforts, that desired outcome that we keep saying isn't within our control, you improve the odds of that desired outcome coming to fruition just by improving your systems. Another important point, don't rely on willpower or motivation. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'll exercise tomorrow when I feel like it, right? We think our future self is going to be more motivated or more uh, agreeable to doing these things. It's just unreliable. But if you have a system, if you say, you know, in the morning, I'm going to do this, you're more likely to achieve these goals. Um, and another important concept, and Marcus is big on this, he says, let doing the right thing be reward enough. So just know that you did the right thing and that should be sufficient. What does that mean? A lot of people do things for praise, appreciation, credit, public recognition, and then those things do or don't happen or they happen to a lesser extent than we wanted. So stoicism empowers us by saying, those things are out of our control. Focus on what's important to you, meaningful to you, what you feel is the right thing to do. And if you do that, that is reward enough. So practical application, um, applying these things to your health, your finances, career, side hustle, etc. With that, we'll go to the next slide. And ooh, I will try to pick up the pace. Um, so here we'll talk about um, premeditatio malorum. This is Latin for uh, it's basically premeditating on catastrophes or evils or troubles. So um, it's probably self-explanatory at this point. We spoke about a market downturn. So don't just um, imagine it as a, rem a remote possibility. As you um, adjust your lifestyle, your spending, your income, your savings, your withdrawal, your portfolio construction, think, okay, could I survive a 20% sustained downturn? What if the market tanked and remained, you know, down 20% or 30% or even 50% for X number of years, how would you handle that? So you, you could um, really play it out. You could do the numbers and you could say, okay, I park this much cash or, you know, whatever, or you have dividend investments or other income sources so that you are equipped if and when that terrible thing happens that you don't have to experience the level of anxiety that other people might or that you otherwise would have. Um, similarly, you can prepare for illness or adversity. Uh, this quote, sweat more in training, bleed less in war, self-explanatory. And Mike Tyson has a famous quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. The Stoics would say, plan to get punched in the face. With that, we'll move to the next slide, uh, slide five, uh, or rather, by the way, cre credit oh. credit to Gory for that, by the way. That's great. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I'm sure someone else uh, would have said that. Um, so framing, very important here. A lot of this um, is probably intuitive, just that using your ability to change your perspective to your advantage can be very powerful. So if you view obstacles as opportunities to improve, you can be strengthened by them and you can also respond with virtue. And there are many examples of this. And, you know, I'm sure uh, every person has uh, some challenge they experienced in their life where they met that challenge and exited stronger. And a lot of people will say um, life was better on the other side of that challenge. Uh, Marcus talks about this in meditations that are reflexive reaction, you know, you could feel overwhelmed or you could feel self-pity. Uh, Charlie Munger will say self-pity is one of the most useless emotions. But again, these are reflexive. So we can't expect ourselves to not experience them. But the tool to apply here is, Marcus would say, who better than me to handle this, right? He was in a position of power and influence. And instead of dwelling in this feeling of being overwhelmed, he said, okay, what can I do to make this better? And who better than me to solve this? And we can each find 
things in our life to apply that to. In the FIRE community, there's a well-known phrase called one more year syndrome. A lot of people who um, make good incomes have significant savings. They've mapped out via spreadsheets and they think with a high probability they can retire early. But then they say, I'll work for one more year just in case. I'll save up one more year of income for that additional buffer. And perhaps there's nothing wrong with that. And perhaps that's the right choice for them. But using framing, we could say, what's the worst that could happen if you stopped working? You could probably go back to work so that if you, and this is exhaustively studied, a lot of people say they wish they retired early. And there are many reasons for that. But a lot of people um, don't act on that. And they, you know, they stay working. And then when they finally re retire, they say, oh, you know, I'm not physically able or I'm not, you know, um, whatever. It could be capacity or family or friends. They're not able to enjoy life to the extent they would have had they um, retired early. And you could, you could apply that to many other things. I'll try to pick up the pace because we still have a lot to cover. Uh, feeling grateful for what you have. This is obviously not limited to stoicism. This is found in probably, you know, all of the world's philosophies. Um, realize that we take things for granted. That seems to be human nature. But if you zoom out from your own life and see how others would see you from, from far away or from, you know, way up above, we each have many things to feel appreciative of and grateful for. And more specifically, I feel this is factual, it sounds exaggerated, but several billion people around the planet would probably trade their life for yours, right? Your comforts, your conveniences, your access to healthcare or amenities. These are things we so take for granted, we lose sight of it day to day, but other people would give uh, a lot to have what we take for granted. Um, and, you know, overlaying that to even as recently as 100 years ago, some, some kings um, had less quality of life than we have today, be it running water or, you know, uh, effective medicine. So these are things that even the most powerful, the wealthiest people in the world 100 years ago didn't have that we have. Um, and then the last, uh, I'll skip to the last bullet. Uh, imagine you died or were severely injured or had something taken away. It could be a family member, a loved one. Um, Sam Harris talks about this. He says they're around a dinner table and the family, everyone was on their phone. Everyone was depressed and sullen. And he joined in that mindset. And then he kind of zoomed out and he said, you know, what if something, what if I died tonight, right? That could happen to any of us. Um, he would give anything for this moment to be with his family, to have a quiet, basic dinner. So with that framing, that's the tool here, he was able to re-engage and appreciate what he had. Uh, so with that, we'll move to uh, behavioral finance. So hopefully people found uh, philosophy of stoicism relatable, practical, there, there are tools um, that we can use throughout the day, any day throughout, you know, our lives. Um, and the overlap with behavioral finance, hopefully people um, previewed this wiki page. Uh, the link is here and it was in the invite. Um, listed on the screen are common pitfalls. On the next slide, we'll, tank, we'll talk more about anchoring and loss aversion more specifically. But these behavioral pitfalls are so embedded in us and in our daily lives that we don't realize they're going on. And what behavioral finance teaches us is these are unconscious biases a lot of times, right? If you ask the average person or even ourselves, um, are you being rational, fact, factual, logical, objective? A lot of times we would say yes. Many instances we would say no by intent. But a lot of times our decision making, we think we're being rational, factual, uh, factual, logical, and it's just not the case. So behavioral finance has studied this and teaches us um, about these biases in more detail. So highly encourage people to get more familiar via the wiki page, and there are many online resources about this, um, just high level confirmation bias. Um, you know, search engines are, are a huge example of this, that um, we are more likely to Google something the way we phrase it 
the result will more likely confirm our existing beliefs. And, you know, we would often benefit by seeking out disconfirming evidence. So you, we need to be aware that sometimes, you know, it's well known now, especially in the political environment, we, a lot of us live in echo chambers. So it's important to um, realize that we are uh, kind of hindering the broadening of our perspective um, with it's, something as simple as a search engine. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, on the confirmation bias, yep. uh, Gory, I was just going to point out, you know, just think, imagine the, the, the tool, the, the Boglehead forum is, right, in terms of challenging your confirmation bias, right, stating, you know, hey, these are the advantages, disadvantages, and having debate, you know, people, people having healthy challenges, right, so it's, I mean, just what, what a wonderful resource we have, you know, in modern day life uh, to have somewhere where you can, you know, have the internet, you know, poke holes in, 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 you know, a lot of these behavioral pitfalls, right. Uh, you know, on, you know, is my logic clear? Am I reasoning properly? Right. You know, during market downturns, right. You see, uh, there's actually more people visit the Boglehead forum, uh, during market downturns, right. Um, is that, you know, they're, 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 uh, basically it's, it's, they're using, folks use it as a tool, uh, to help mitigate, you know, some of these behavioral, uh, pitfalls, uh, that are known, known to plague, you know, humans, um, and our behavior towards, uh, personal finance. Excellent point. Um, I'll mention two others on this slide before we go to the next slide. Uh, one framing effect, um, I'll share a, a recent personal example and this will be less finance, but the importance of framing. So my wife and I went um, on a retreat a few weekends ago to a few hours north of New York City, really scenic place. Uh, we were with a, a great group, it was actually on stoicism and um, one of the attendees flew in from Denver and his flight got canceled. Fortunately, me, fortunately we exchanged uh, info, contact info before we parted and he ended up staying with us. His flight from Newark got um, completely canceled and they put him on a flight out of LaGuardia, um, which is closer to where we live um, in, within New York City. Uh, so he ended up staying with us and he had um, time in the morning to enjoy New York City. So we went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and we just had a nice time spending time with him. We had a healthy meal together and he he wrote that his, he could easily have been so upset about the canceled flight and he could have been screaming just like so many other people in the airport, but he reframed it that he got better memories from his flight being canceled than he would have otherwise. Okay, and the last one um, I'll talk about on this slide is recency bias. You see it in the third column, second from the bottom. A clear example of this is how we sometimes instinctively react to a market downturn or sometimes the, a bubble fueled by euphoria, right? Although we know the market's performance over decades that it keeps chugging along despite you know, World War I, World War II, recessions, depression, uh, COVID, tech bubble, housing bubble, uh, the market trends upwards. But recency bias, if, if the news like uh, Lucas's slide, the, the media says sell, 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 recency bias is so powerful, it can override our conscious decision making because we, we believe this you know, recency bias is so powerful, it can, the belief can override our, our logic. And, and the same is on an uptrend, right? We can uh, believe in this euphoric bubble and often people enter just, just before the peak. So with that, again, uh, we encourage folks to visit that, to start at least with this uh, wiki page. Um, with that, we'll go to the next slide. And uh, we'll talk about Daniel Kahneman, huge contributor in behavioral finance. Um, he won the Nobel in economics uh, for his work, bridging psychology with behavioral finance. Uh, his contribution, um, one of the foundations of his work is framing um, our thinking through two systems, system one and system two. And this is well written about in his uh, book, Thinking, Comma, Fast and Slow. So it's Thinking Fast and Slow. 
And system one's basically our reflexive, call it reptilian brain. And this is evolutionarily very, very important, right? On the savannas, we didn't have time to reason and think and analyze and reach the most logical decision, right? You're being chased by a tiger and you need to, uh, a lot of tribal behavior, you know, uh, ties to evolutionary psychology. And it, it makes sense why system one is so powerful. And system two complements system one. And that is, uh, it requires more effort, more intense focus, and it operates methodically. So his work isn't about squashing one with the other. It's not like system two is in fact better. They coexist. We just need to separate and recognize which one is being active. And then from that, we can make better decisions. So if we go to the, the top two bolded questions, how often are we in control of our decisions? We would think most of the time or a lot of the time. And it's frequently not, it depends how you define we, but there's so much going on unconsciously or around us. Externally, we can be manipulated. Um, a, lo a lot of marketers take advantage of these biases and manipulate us and even people informed get manipulated. Uh, so the second question, how often are we rational when making decisions? Um, frequently not, even though we think we are. Um, so jumping to the, the last two, so loss aversion, this is well studied. Um, folks, and it's almost human nature to be more averse to losing than we are winning. And sometimes in this example, losing $100 hurts more than winning $150. And that's, you could argue, irrational or illogical, but this is how powerful loss is to us. So that's the, the bias of loss aversion. And then anchoring uh, has many examples in personal finance. And one is, um, you know, in any negotiation, an opening price will become the anchor. And so you can think about it in terms of, we were speaking on an earlier Bogleheads call, um, a parent has an adult child getting married and they said, you know, here's the price per person. And if, if the kid was using anchoring in, as a negotiation technique, they could start with a super high price, like 300 a person or 500 a person, whatever it is these days. And then the, the parent can react and then the, the kid can say the real price or a much lower price. Oh, you know, how about 150? And then, you know, the, the person writing the check feels relieved. An example of this in the retail marketplace let's say someone puts out a high-end designer shoe, markets it for $500, right? And no one buys it, but it's marketed for 500. And then suddenly the retailer marks it down for to 200. All of a sudden people think, wow, it's on sale. Wow, it's such a discount. And they buy it. Even though they may not have bought it at 200 originally, they suddenly buy it because of anchoring bias. Another example of this, uh, you can have a contractor give a quote and that that first quote will affect, you know, how you frame that project or the cost or how agreeable you are to it. Um, so hopefully, oh, and a stock purchase price. Um, I'll close with that example for anchoring. Um, a lot of people won't sell a stock until they say it recovers, but the universe doesn't care about your purchase price um, and the stock may never recover. So we are anchored to this purchase price because we think, we may be entitled to recoup our losses. And it's just, you know, I, I want to say it's just not the case, but I can't say what you're entitled to or not. But um, it's basically um, an effect of anchoring. Um, so we, we should close to leave enough time for q and I do want to mention um, a book uh, called Scout Mindset by Julia Gallup. She has a TED Talk on YouTube also where she uses a phrase motivated reasoning and that explains evolutionarily why we hinge to these beliefs that are influenced by desires and fears um, and why we let those things uh, cause us to misinterpret information. And sometimes it's because we want to win, right? Winning is more important or in tribal behavior, or, you know, our uh, evolutionary ancestors um, needed to 
exude confidence. And so sometimes we're, we're less likely to admit we're wrong. Um, and so I would say in closing, um, just in terms of practical tools, what, we, what can we do to improve on all these biases and our unconscious tendencies? And one approach is distancing yourself from the feeling of shame of being wrong, right? Like we, we sometimes make investments and we're committed to them and stay the course has a lot of value to it if the portfolio is well-structured and the investment choices are good. But a lot of times um, we make bad investments and we cling to them because of the shame of being wrong or that applies to a lot of things in life. But if you distance yourself from that and you zoom out and you kind of apply objectivity, you can work towards a more rational decision. Um, and you can take pride in being someone who's comfortable changing their minds. A lot of leaders or a lot of uh, people publicly think it's a weakness to change your mind. But if you get new information, new material information, it makes sense to change your mind. Um, another tool is seeking out blind spots, right? I mentioned disconfirming evidence earlier. Find, try to figure out what you're missing. Um, we spoke about por portfolio construction. Once you have a good alignment in terms of your goals, time frame, risk tolerance, asset allocation, diversification, right? Fundamental for the Bogleheads, you need not check your portfolio constantly. And that will protect you from these unconscious biases, right? We're human, we are subject to fear and greed, um, and our willpower is often weaker than our ability to reason and be logical. So by not checking your portfolio often, and Bogleheads know this, so I say this in part for our friends and family and coworkers and you know the broader community that comes to Bogleheads for guidance. It's sort of like um, not trusting your willpower around snacks. So they say the, um, the war with healthy foods is won or lost at the supermarket. So you think, oh, I'll get these cookies or chips and I'll have the willpower to not eat them. But once they're in the house, your willpower is weak and you're, you're very likely to, to eat them. So how does that apply to a portfolio? By checking it constantly, you're subjecting yourself to testing your willpower. By saying, I don't need to check it, I'm gonna stay the course, um, you're more likely to not make impulsive changes. With that, um, we can go to the next slide for closing quotes. Um, you have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Um, so hopefully folks can tie Marcus's wisdom there to, to many things in life. Uh, Jack Bogle in Enough spoke about the importance of character, which is mentioned um, is fundamental to stoicism, fundamental to how we can define ourselves. So he says, in life, we too often allow the illusory to triumph over the real. We focus too much on things and not enough on the intangibles that make things worthwhile, too much on success, a word I never liked, and not enough on character, without which success is meaningless. So completely aligned with uh, the philosophy of stoicism. And the last quote, um, this uh, I believe Miriam found, and Jack was a participant on the forum and he posted to the Bogleheads and he wrote, good morning, my friends, a lot will happen in the coming 12 months. It's a perilous world out there. So get your asset allocation right for you and then just stay the course. Best always, Jack. Uh, with that, we'll go to additional resources. Folks will um, have this via the PDF, uh, various books written by people we've spoken about. Um, Dan Ariely, another leader in the space, predictably irrational. Uh, Richard Thaler, if folks are interested, um, co-wrote Nudge. Um, there's so much there, like um, there's just too much. I Opting in and opting out for 401k plans is now normal. And this this is something that Nudge talks about, that people have inertia and they're less likely to enroll in a 401k plan if they see all these choices. So Congress passed the Pension Protection Act, I think it was 1996, and folks can be automatically opted in to their 401k plan as a result. Another example of that is organ donation. So I think Dan Ariely writes about this, that uh, some of the, um, say, uh, Sweden, Denmark type, uh, that area of countries, 
have different opt-in and opt-out for organ donations. And so the, the organ donor participation rate is so dramatically different just because of the opt-in opt-out because people experience inertia. And if you opt them into organ donation, it's shocking. Many people will agree to donate their organs. Okay, uh, Winner's Curse, another one by Thaler. And then in terms of stoicism, uh, we spoke about Marcus as an original source. Bill Irvine, A Guide to the Good Life is a great a portal, a starting point to stoicism, very digestible, very practical. Um, he's a modern day academic. He lives and teaches in Ohio. Uh, there are other um, modern day academics, Massimo Pilucci, who's listed here, uh, has very accessible free blogs. He has free eBooks. Uh, he has dozens of YouTube videos, incredibly articulate um, and practical. So with that, um, we'll open it up for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Gori. Thank you, Lucas. That was very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. I'm sure Mr. Bogle would have enjoyed it also. Thank you for the quotes, Gori, from Mr. Bogle. Sure. Do we have any questions? Are there any questions in the chat? Anybody like to start out with questions, raising your hand? We do have one chat question. Okay. It's from Yuli G. Why do we say that action or inaction is out of our control? I believe that was posted during your Archer example. Okay. I can comment, but Luke, did you want to take it? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so the question, why do we say action or inaction, right? So kind of, this is, why is this considered out of our control? So without, without getting too philosophical, um, the, the, the Stoics, they, I mean, they're, they're pretty big on the part that you control is your mind. And really once things, once like, outside of your mind you don't necessarily control it right so they actually they the, the way they describe it is there's actually something else in between here which this is just a it's just a model right some some models are useful but it's not always 100 percent accurate but there, there's actually the it would be uh, an impulse an, a mental impulse to action right that you control which would then lead to that that your body which would take the action, but you aren't necessarily in control of your body. Uh, example would be, let's say you go throw to baseball, right? Uh, maybe 99 times out of 100, you know that that your your arm's going to function exactly as you want it to. Uh, but you know maybe that one time, you know something happens and your your arm just isn't functioning the way it does, right? Or you know even like a major league pitcher uh, is. You know, they, they try to control their action as best they can, right, to, you know, make sure that they're throwing the best pitch possible. Uh, but even then, even the most trained athletes in the world uh, lose control. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, the idea that you're in control of the impulse to action, not necessarily uh, the, the action and, and definitely not in control of the outcome of the action. Is that Lucas, would, answer that would you say would you say then that when the archer releases the arrow this action or inaction there would start as soon as the arrow is released and then the outcome is the target well it, i mean going off of our example it actually would probably the part that he controls would probably stop at his mind um even though it i mean it is it, it's kind of a, and, and I know philosophers debate about this, right? Like where, where exactly do you draw the line of what you control and what you don't control, right? Um, and it's, it's, but yeah, that's, that's, that's my understanding. And by the way, I'm, I'm absolutely 100% not a professional philosopher. Um, this is just to the best of my knowledge. Um, and I'm sure there's a grad student somewhere that may watch this video that is rolling their eyes. Um, at some of these responses, but that's that's uh, that's that's my understanding is 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 uh, the things that we control. It starts and stops uh, with uh, within the mind, 
and that's that's kind of uh the 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 uh kind of a core tenant of of, of stoic philosophy well if we have any grad students rolling their eyes uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can raise your hand or speak up yeah what about when it says do not on, on this slide I think what uh, the question might have meant was action or inaction with our portfolio. In other words, we can do nothing, we can stay the course when uh, the markets around us are in turmoil, but that is really an action that we take. It's not something that is um, out of our control. We can, for example, move some of our money if we're going to retire in the next year or two we might want to preserve some of our 401k that is in stocks, preserve it in a stable value fund or something, just to make sure that when we retire in a year or two, it doesn't, doesn't tank really bad for us. Um, that is an action that we take based upon external events, but it's our reading of them. And also it's being practical. And I think Mr. Bogle would agree that changing the course for practical personal reasons based upon your life situation is appropriate. Um, but not to react to the markets and say, the market's tanking, therefore I'm going to sell. That would not be what he would advocate. Right. So would you say in that case, you're not really, maybe that needs to be moved yeah. into the... Well so may maybe the way to think about it is like a cause and effect relationship, right? So your cause is really impacting the effect, right? So uh, the effect of it would be the action. And, and maybe it's, it's kind of, and this is kind of what <laughs> philosophers end up they're talking about definitions of words all the time, right? Um, so it, it may end up being exactly what are, how are we going to define action uh, versus the impression and at what point in between. Um, but but I think the baseline underlying idea, right, is, is the, the, the causes, the cause that you are that have effects in the world outside of us all come from initially from the, the mind and then the impulse uh, to action, which then the effect of which is action. Is, I, it, it, I mean, I, it's kind of a I, I'm trying not to give too philosophical of an answer, but that's that's a, I, don't, I don't know I don't know if Gory if you have a better answer, but that's about that. <laughs> as yeah, best no. the one that I can give right now. Yeah, I think that's reasonable, and I'd reiterate um, what Miriam said in terms of how Jack would answer this. I think that quote that we read of Jack's, he inserts that to make sure the portfolio is right for you. If you go to that that quote, Lucas. The, um, it was yeah. the, the ending closing quotes. Yeah, this one. So he says, so get your asset allocation right pause for you. So I think that's what Miriam was commenting towards that um, as long as the allocation is right for you and for you means at this particular, particular phase of life or this time, right? It's not just, there's no static you because as you age, maybe you want your portfolio to be more conservative, but if you have other income sources and you're not relying on your portfolio, maybe you don't necessarily want it to be more conservative. So there's no single answer here, but so it's for you. It's very that specific piece and then stay the course. But to Miriam's point, if it's not appropriate for you, let's say your circumstances change. Let's say there's a medical event or a family friend in need, or you know, it could be any of dozens of things so that this for you is a, a material change, then it would warrant the change. That's, that's how I read it. Um, any other questions in the chat or live questions? Anyone want to raise their hand since we have about six minutes in the allocated time? Um, in the absence of questions, I, and if it's one, okay, yep. We have, oh, this lady geeking up. We have one, one someone uh, said, uh, is asking, is there truly a reliable, stable fund? And then, of course, I fired back with the link to the wiki article, but was there anything uh, more involved with the word stable value in terms of finance? Uh, actually, the uh, stable value fund is insur our insurance contracts, but maybe there was yes. something applied there. I, hmm. 
I was the one that used that example. Uh, in my 401k, there was a stable value fund and a stable value fund is like Lady Geek says, it's offered by insurance companies, but it's in part of a 401k or a 540, uh, what is it? A five, um, 457B plan. Um, my understanding is they're not offered outside of workplace employer plans. And what it is, it's, it's kind of like a money market. No, it's not a money market. It's not a short-term paper fund. It is more like a, a CD, shall we? Uh, my stable value fund the, um, was actually offered by Voya through T. Rowe Price. And they would guarantee a certain percent. You would earn a certain percent and it was a lot. It was like 4% for a year or a year and a half. At that point, it would be, they would tell you when it was up and then they would renegotiate and you could guarantee for that period of time, that's what it was. So in that sense, the stable value fund was stable, but it was within the workplace. It's not with outside in a 401k or something. You can't buy them on the open market is my understanding. Mm. Um, and Jim, do you have a uh, question? Do they have an area in their life that maybe they got? Wait, we can't hear you. We can't understand you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on a weird remote connection, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just sit down. Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. We. Yep. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So my question to both presenters is: Is there an area in your life in which you use stoicism to get control of or to? to get it on the on the stoicism line and then what what things do you feel that um, you might be slipping away from that whether the trigger items or what uh, what gives you that sense that uh, you're you're falling off the wagon for, for stoicism hmm lucas do you want to start yeah so i mean oh so there's two questions there the first first was kind of I guess I, I think that was kind of how, how did how did you kind of get into it? Was that that was kind of the first question, right? Um, well, or, or something that you really thought you had a control over oh, by using gotcha. stoicism, but now you felt at times you slip away. And what, what's telling you that? <laughs> I uh, well, when when I kind of first started paying more attention to my personal finances. Um, you know, there's, uh, so, well, so I'm going to back up. So one, one idea within stoicism, you don't control other people, right? You can offer suggestions, but you don't control other people. Um, when, when I first started talk, like constant focusing a little bit more on personal finance, um, I, I had to learn that I do not control my spouse's spending. Um, and that was, that was something that, right. We, uh, in terms of, you know, budgeting and that sort of thing, right? That it, you don't completely control the other person, right? Um, and so that was something that um, it was, you know, a bit of a, a, a learning um, from, from my end. Hmm. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll answer um, kind of more broadly. I think it's so practical um, daily, like you can meet most any challenge with it. Like, uh, let's say I drop something and it spills all over the floor. I think, you know, man, I'm, you know, it's very upsetting. And then I just, before reacting, like uh, before losing one's temper or whatever, I'll just like zoom out and say, all right, it's actually no big deal. I could clean that up pretty easily. And then you do. And that might be a really simple example, but you could expand on that to, to almost, you know, many unwanted things in life and just zoom out um, and reframe and then realize this has a solution. This has a, a practical approach and I can take action for it. And then it's like instantly empowering. Um, I'll respond to what uh, the other thing you asked about veering from it um, to the credit of stoic philosophers. They um, Seneca referred to himself as a patient in the hospital amongst other patients. So he was writing to his friend and he wasn't claiming to have 
like some superior enlightenment. He was just saying, these are things that, that work, that help me, that may help you. And uh, so Stoicism was big on pulling the best ideas wherever they existed. It was not... Um, it was not confined to these certain beliefs. And in fact, I think Seneca said he, he doesn't mind being a spy in the enemy's camp as long as they are doing something better that he can learn from. He's happy to, to take that knowledge. And so uh, when you said veering from it, there, there are many instances where um, you really have to reach, like it's, it's not immediate. But if you find something better, and Marcus says this too, if you find something better than courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom, then go for it. But in his lifetime, in his practicing of you know running the empire for 20 years, he did not find anything better than the combination of those four. So I see we're at 9.30. Um, if folks want to stay on, I... Um, I think in a minute or two, I could highlight some takeaways from this Scout Mindset book because it's so relevant. I, we didn't include it as um, an additional resource because it's not behavioral finance, but. I have another behavior yes. finance question. Oh, sure. And it has to do with um, the losing of $100. We hate more than making $150. Mm -hmm. I've read that before. Um, and that relates to the stoic view of what, I can't remember what, and actually it occurred to me when you posted that slide, there might be an evolutionary reason for it. In other words, when you had the, um, the savanna, you know, running mm -hmm. from the tiger in yeah. the savanna, that um, if you, sometimes losing something has greater risk you're more at risk when you lose something than making something. That as long as you make something, you're okay. But losing something, you can lose your life. Sure. And there's also a sentimentality. There's an emotional attachment to things. They've done this experiment with what people will pay for concert tickets or show tickets. And once they own that ticket, they experiment by saying, if we offered you X percent more, or X dollars more than what you paid, people will hold on to that ticket, even though they were they were only willing to pay up to a certain amount for it. Logically, you think they would sell it for a higher price, but not necessarily because there's an emotional uh, bias. And I think that was included more so for behavioral finance and less so than a, a stoic concept, but included there as an overlap into behavioral finance. And I see that Jim, is, is I, you have your hand up. Did you have a, another question? Jim, did you want to you're, you're lower your hand? Yeah. Oh. No, okay. Looks lower like his hand. Lowered it. <laughs> okay. So Great. I don't know if, if folks are staying on, but I think there's there's so much value in in this uh, scout mindset. Um, that I'll just quickly cover some of her points because part of the part of the theme of this presentation is that we are often not rational, but it's within our power to to find tools and and use those tools and strengthen our ability to be rational, logical, and less influenced by unconscious biases. So she says, "How do we get there?" And she she her paradigm is scout versus soldier. Soldiers are performing a certain function. Scouts go out and try to get the lay of the land aligned with reality and objective reality. That's part of how she defines a scout's purpose. And she says, what traits are in people who are more likely to be good scouts? So what traits are more likely? And she found curiosity is a commonality feeling pleasure from learning new information. So that can help you identify objective reality. Itching to solve a puzzle versus just accepting things how they are. Um, being intrigued when you encounter something that contradicts your expectations or your assumptions or your conclusions. Um, and all of these things might sound, oh, intuitive or easy or yeah, who wouldn't do that? But 
realistically day to day and year to year and entire lifetimes, we are often ingrained in our ways and our habits that we don't realize we're not being logical, rational, practical, as we've said. So she said, feel, uh, they feel virtuous testing their own beliefs. And this was fundamental to Stoics. When, when I say Marcus said, if you find anything better than courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom, he adamantly meant test your assumptions, test your conclusions, you know, and if you, if your, your assumptions were wrong, your hypothesis had holes in it, you know, strengthen it. So not being married to um, early conclusions. Um, we spoke about uh, being less likely to consider someone weak if they change their mind, right? Like in politics, we saw this phrase waffling and it was, it was framed negatively um, but as you find new information, it's actually a strength to, to sometimes evolve with that new information. So those were some traits for what she found to be a scout mindset. And Thanks for sharing, Gary. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any other questions? Nothing okay. in the chat. Um, one thing, Gori. Yep. Um, the finance buff, uh, also known as his name is Harry Sit. He often get he's a, a Boglehead who writes on the Boglehead forum. He has his own uh, blog, thefinancebuff.com. No dot. Yeah, dot com. I think he um, had a wonderful article years ago, and he called it um, "Safety in the Mainstream." And basically, it relates to the, mm -hmm. the stoic values that you were talking about, or the value of you, that you do the best you can with what you can control. Mm -hmm. And what you cannot control, you don't lose your sleep over, you don't stress over it. Mm -hmm. You do the best you can. And he related that to index funds, investing in index funds. Mm -hmm. But that is why he invest in index funds. Mm -hmm. He said, because um, I do the best I can, I create my portfolio with index funds, knowing that at least I will receive market returns. Mm -hmm. That if the market tanks, if the market goes down, if there's a recession, if there is just a bear market, my, my index funds are going to go down, my stock funds are going to go down, but I did not cause that. The market mm -hmm. caused that. I invested in index funds and I know that they will go up and down, but I don't have to worry. I, I am safe from my own emotions mm -hmm. of kicking myself that I invested in a stupid stock. Mm -hmm. I did not invest in a stupid stock. I put my money in the index fund that invests in 3000 stocks and it is doing what I expected it to do. It is following the market. And so I am happy. I'm happy. I'm safe. I, uh -huh. I was safe in what I did in my own mind. Yeah, excellent example. Super practical. And again, sometimes it takes uh, convincing ourselves like it's an exercise, right? If your portfolio goes down, it's really hard to feel um, isolated from that experience right but but you can do exactly miriam you can do exactly what miriam just said like think about the decision you made how you made it that you made the best decision at the time with what was available to you and you can find consolation in that you can find comfort and peace of mind as many the the thing is i think so many bogleheads know this that it's interesting um folks who who might benefit the most from this message uh, are not, you know, hearing it as easily because there's so much noise in the world and the media that, you know, this practical approach gets drowned out. But yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate um, another thing, you know, that overlaps that a lot of these things are so much easier to say, but they are in fact within our reach. They are 
able to be practiced and they are, they do strengthen with time. So understanding that they're more natural, intuitive. Thank you.